This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So the question is, um, why is it important nowadays to smell at all? And um, <clears throat> the question was raised by that there are quite a lot of people, or by the fact that there are quite a lot of people uh, who can't smell at all, or who have a very reduced sense of smell. So if you take the whole proportion of people, um, then you have about one, uh, one fifth of the population who has an olfactory loss, and then you have up to one to five percent of the people um, among those who are functional or nosmic. And then you have this very small blue line here, a very small red line here, is our congenital anosmic people that are not too many. And you have quite a high proportion of one to five percent of people with um, qualitative disorders, which is phantasmia, parosmia, they smell things which are actually not there. Um, just a little bit about this um, congenital anosmia. We did some studies on that, on isolated congenital anosmia, so people who were never able in their life to smell without having any known additional disorder like Hellman syndrome. So uh, isolated congenital um, anosmia. For those people, um, it's not only detected or someone in the family or themselves, they get suspicious about their disorder in me. I mean, you know this much better than I do, but in average, um, they get suspicious about the disorder at about um, the 10th year. And then it takes 13 more years until they are finally diagnosed. And in the meantime, a lot of things happen, and a lot of those things, at least the people tell us, um, are that no one believes them, which is quite a problem. Um, yeah, some basic facts of factory perception decreases with age. Women outperform men slightly, but really slightly. However, the importance of the olfactory system, measured with a questionnaire, um, is higher in women compared to men. And this applies to associations, applications where so they actually use their sense of smell more, or they indicate this more, and they draw more consequences. So if they don't like the smell of the tomato, then they don't buy it. For the men, this does not play that much a role. Um, what are the functions of the olfactory system? There is this review article from Stevenson, 2010, which is very nice. Um, and he pointed out that there are three major functions of the olfactory system, which is food, actually, digestive behavior, awareness of environmental hazards, and social communication. However, like we have heard before from Ron, um, the visual system is quite prominent. And the visual system can provide a lot of those information. I mean, you can look at food nowadays, at least in modern life, we can look at food, we can have the best before on almost every food we buy, we can see is this a good thing or not. Uh, we are warned about all kinds of conditions. And um, the visual system is quite good in giving social comment or social cues. So if we take this together, together um, we have a high proportion of people who can't smell or have a reduced sense of smell. and. Um, there are a lot of things which can supply the sense of smell. Do we need a sense of smell at all? And what does it do? So, oh, let's talk a little bit about all the emotions. Um, Sylvia already uh, talked a lot about this. So you have a, the general model, one of the general models, one of the many general models about emotion is um, that you have a stimuli, you orient to this one, then you retrieve some contextual details from your memory, Conscious or unconsciously, um, you have an emotion, and this makes you ready to behave in some way. However, for orders, it's a little more complicated, I think, um, because this orientation step here, this is hindered. So <clears throat> we made a small olfactory change detection test, which is not published yet, and um, we gave our participants the same order again and again, and at some point we just changed it. So rose, 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 rotten X, rotten X, rotten X, rose, 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 rotten X. And we did this. So here yeah, is a molecule smelling a little bit like rose, at least we believe this, in low and in high concentrations. And here this is this H2S, in low and in high concentrations. What we see is that our participants have only detected half of the rose stimuli at all. 
For the other ones, they still be probably they still believe that it was rotten eggs or they did not care or whatever. Or through we ask them, please indicate as soon as you um, detect any changes of the olfactory environment. So the unpleasant stimulus has a higher cell depth and is detected more easily. That's um, data we have seen, relatively similar data from one before. This is an olfactory identification test and um, it's the Loma Sniff and Sticks test, 60 items. If you ask the people to identify the items in acute order, so choosing one out of four stimuli, then people are normally relatively good. There are some effects on the top. However, if you ask them um, to give a free identification of what they have smelled, then they are very listening back. So it's about one fourth of the orders where they can say what this actually is. And I mean, you can probably argue that our apple does not really smell like apple. It could be, uh, could be some kind of strange apple. But if I would draw in here a picture of some uh, strange looking apple, you would still be able to say, OK, that's an apple. But for the sense of smell, this does not work. Or it works very bad. And um, that's the um, retronasal test, which was also mentioned in Ron's talk. Um, for this retronasal test, um, we had the idea that we wanted to create a retronasal test which we can apply on different countries. So this test was given, <coughs> yeah, this test was given to seven different countries, and then we wanted to choose only those orders who are um, identified as similarly good in all of those countries. So in red, I mark all of the orders um, which have significant differences in identification. These are those. So it's only three which are actually left. So um, your cultural influence or your cultural impact, how you're raised up, uh, how your surrounding is, what's your um, behavior in cooking, and what's the thing is you are yeah, you normally do, and has a strong impact in how you recognize orders and how you identify orders. So the point is um, that <coughs> the detection of orders is not as simple as it might be in different senses, and the categorization of orders is hindered, so you cannot really say what something is, and even if you could say it, you don't agree. Of course, there's a different way. Orders do not only evoke emotions when you really know what this order is. You can bypass this as you, as you all know. Um, we have done some work with basic emotions. Um, and Sylvia has talked about the basic emotions, which is very good, so I don't have to introduce this again. And um, we asked our participants, could you please describe, or just name, could you please name one order which would evoke happiness? Could you name one order which would evoke disgust? Could you name one order which would evoke anger, anxiety, and sadness? And we did not tell them, not explicitly, that they were allowed to leave anything blank. However, of course, they did. If they could not come up with anything, then they did leave things blank. So if they left something blank, then it is red. If they wrote down something, it's green. So almost all participants, which were 419, um, could tell us some order which would evoke happiness in them. Almost everyone could tell us some order which would evoke disgust in them. But they have some problems in naming any order which would evoke um, anger or Anxiety is much better, or sadness. All those um, <coughs> names for sadness were very much um, related to context. It was like the smell of my grandmother's house it was a very typical example. So we did the same for pictures as a control. Here we have this uh, similar effect. It is more difficult to um, name a picture. Picture is probably not the right translation, but. Um, to name something they would see, which would make them feel angry or anxious or sad. However, that's not significant difference. The difference between difference between orders and pictures is. So orders do not evoke every basic emotion. Um, there's another interesting um, study, probably you know, um, from Maria Lasser and Johan Willander about autobiographical evoked memories. If you ask, if you give persons an order and um, ask them, could you please tell me some autobiographical memory? What does this remind you of? 
um, they will very often not say anything because they don't have any memory. That's quite a, or seems to be quite a robust finding, which matches um, the identification results we have. However, if they say some order, or if they say some memory, then this memory is related very far back in childhood. So, you know, on the first decade of life. If you do the same as a control for pictures or for words, um, then they can almost always say anything. So, for instance, I tell you the word skirt, and then you could tell me maybe, yes, I have been when I was um, on my first date, then I had this particular skirt. This would be a typical autobiographical memory. And then I would ask, how old were you? And you would say, I was 15 or something. So, uh, memories evoked by words or by um, visual cues are later, they are in about the second up to third decade of life. Memories evoked by um, authors are relatively rare, but earlier, and even more emotional. Um, as we come back to the basic emotion study I just showed you, um, we looked a little bit what were actually the authors the people wrote down, and we tried to group them into some useful um, categories. And orders evoking disgust are related to death and waste and organic products, mainly feces. A lot of those things are about feces. Orders <laughs> um, evoking happiness and um, plants, food. What is interesting here, I think, is that you ask people um, to write down an order which would evoke any emotion. They almost never name any social order which would be related to humans. So the order of my boyfriend, or the order of my mother, the order of my child, something like this, which quite has a high importance, they don't name this explicitly. If you do the same with pictures, then um, the view of another human is quite an important thing. However, um, orders are, of course, social relevant, and they are able to uh, transport social um, relevant information. Um, yeah, I'm citing a lot of studies I just read. Um, so it seems <coughs> to be or there are indications that um, humans are able to detect shameful signals um, which are emitted by human tears. So in other words, it could be possible that we are able to perceive if someone else cried just by the of smell. Um, it is relatively likely that we are able to perceive if someone else is anxious just by the sense of smell. Um, then the study here from Johann Lundström. We are able to identify, women are able to identify the boyfriend of their, uh, the order of their boyfriend when they are very much in love with their boyfriend. If they are not that much in love with their boyfriend, then they are really good in the identifying orders of different men. <laughs> and um, another, another study also from Johann Lundström and others showing that um, the order of newborn babies is a very rewarding thing and activates actually um, reward, the reward circuits in the brain. Um, we did some work with, um, with the immune system and it is possible that orders are able to transport information about another person's immune system, which potentially is relevant for mate choice. So it is quite good if I have a different kind of different immune system um, to my partner, because this will increase um, the resilience of our offspring against pathogens. And it's, yeah, it's possible at least, or we showed this, um, that people can actually smell this information. So when orders um, transport so many social relevant informations, especially about the emotional state of others, then it is relatively likely, and in fact we showed this, that persons who have a very good sense of smell actually um, are more social, or at least they have higher scores on an agreeable level. Agree? A Sex. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's the order threshold. The higher it is, the better you are actually in, <coughs> in perceiving orders. And the higher scores you have, the more yeah, you think yourself you are kind of a team player. And it could be that um, those social information, so the olfactory channel just opens another channel of information for social information, and that gives you 
some kind of advantage. So, others import social relevant signals, persons who perceive such signals are more social, or at least report themselves to be more social. Um, that's an interesting thing here. The study done in a different way. They did not ask about um, basic emotions, they just asked about pleasant orders and unpleasant orders. Which orders are pleasant for you, which orders are unpleasant for you. And then group them in the same way and um, trying to find some meaningful categories of orders and the categories um, emerging from that. So it was kind of a, yeah, from top, uh, from bottom to top way. The categories emerging from this were food orders, nature orders, social relationships, and civilization. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, for pleasant orders, were food orders, and then uh, yeah, some other ones. And now, if you look at the cross cultural differences, they are quite interesting. For no one really likes the pleasant orders most, except for the Mexican people. So, the Mexicans really like um, social orders. And for the unpleasant orders, the Mexican people are relatively down to the bottom. I don't know if Mexican people also are more social than other people. I just have some prejudices about this, but they have to be true. Um, however, orders also warn about danger. That's quite an interesting um, example, which has been in the newspapers in Sweden. Um, and the case was the following, that they had a terrible smell in a school in Sweden. And because of this terrible smell, um, they closed two classrooms for about one month. We were not able to use this one. And a lot of people came and trying to find out what this was. And they took samples from the air and whatever. And at the end, they found out that it was um, just a sports bag in a locker of a student, which was the reason. So it was just sweaty clothes. It was nothing at all. But this caused a big hysteria. Telling us, <laughs> telling us that what is actually really wrong about the interest, about potential dangers. <laughs> we don't know real dangers. And um, what is can even more about dangers if they are not present at all. Um, that's a study, yeah, 1899, <coughs> like an old one, really nice one. Um, and that's a psychology professor, and he was in front of his class, and he had distilled water in a bottle, and then he opened this bottle, and he told um, the students that he wants to measure reaction times. And he want to ask them to raise their hand if they would perceive the order. And he also told them, oh, let me see this. I, he also told them um, that he hoped the order might not be too strong and it would not be too disagreeable to anyone. So people were kind of primed. And that's what happened. In 15 seconds, most of those in the front row had raised their hands. And in 40 seconds, the order had spread to the back of the board, keeping a fairly regular wave form. About three-fourths of the audience claimed to perceive the smell, the minority including more men than the average of the world. More would probably have scumped to the suggestion, but at the end of a minute, I was obliged to stop the experiment, for some of the front seats were be being unpleasantly affected and were about to leave the room. It was distilled water, nothing else. <laughs> so, others warned about danger even if they are not there. Um, one of the mechanisms, how they do this, um, if we stay a little bit in the concept of basic emotions, might be that they won't discuss. Also, very old idea actually, um, originally raised by Darwin, was that this disgust might be strongly related to the sense of smell and touch and eyesight. Uh, we did a study and <coughs> in the study we gave a lot of disgusting stimuli in a lot of sensory modalities to our participants. We had quite some fun in the studies, participants probably not. So they were going to see um, spoiled food, they were going to see an illness related stimulus, they were going to see a picture of feces and a composed stimulus. And they were going to touch all of those things. And they were going to smell all of these things. And they were going to hear all of these things. Um, so, for instance, for spoiled food, um, you could question a little bit the methods. But um, for instance, for spoiled food, they hear someone vomiting. Or for touching feces, we, or touching feces is not to explain, by touching um, illness related, they had a wet tissue they had to grab. 
those things. And then we asked them which motion was booked. And after some time, they were, of course, very bright to discuss. And everything was highly disgusting. So the black bars are discussed. Also, the control items were not. And then um, we took some autonomic measurements. And the interesting thing is the systolic blood pressure here. So you have vision, audition, touch, and olfaction. It's quite hard to see for you, probably. However, in the control stimulus, nothing <coughs> really happens, which is different between the senses. But for the disgust stimuli, and um, that's olfaction, which um, really decreases the blood pressure. That's an um, area under the curve, so that's kind of arbitrary units here. So the disgusting stimuli decreased blood pressure, and it's quite, we yeah, had some problems interpreting it. Um, our idea at the end was that it might um, be related to vomiting and just prepare the body for vomiting. It's parasympathetic. Hmm? It's parasympathetic response. Yeah. And we asked them back, at least some of the participants, so they did this three times. And um, the disgust decreased significantly in all of the modalities except for the olfactory modality. So they still found all of the stimuli as disgusting as they found it before. Um, persons differ in their individual disgust sensitivity. So for the study we had before, we tried to exclude the medical students because we found them not to be disgusted to anything. <laughs> but, um, but you have quite a, quite a range of disgust sensitivity. There are people who are easily disgusted and people who are not. And if you try to correlate disgust sensitivity to pleasantness ratings of different smells, then you see this event smell, which you also used um, in one of your studies. This is the smell of feces. And this is the only one really relating to disgust sensitivity. So the more easy you are disgusted, the more unpleasant you think the smell of feces is. Makes a lot of sense. Um, we did another study in um, the touch perception. You probably noticed you're sitting in the tube next to someone who has kind of a strange smell. You don't want to touch them, but you want to, want to go a little bit to the side. And this is the effect we tried to follow. And um, so we gave our participants stroking stimuli with a robot, a pencil, which was adjusted to a robot, same velocity all of the time. And um, at the same time, they smelled water only, or they smelled rose, or they smelled the select order. And we saw that the rose order did not really enhance. That's, that's the wrong. Ah, that's significant as well, but this as well. Um, the rose did not really enhance the pleasantness of the touch, but the wet order decreased it from here to here as well as from here to here. So um, one could conclude that unpleasant orders are presumably disgusting. Um, olfactory disgust does not seem to habituate. And um, if something is disgusting, then it has a very clear behavioral consequence. Of course, in the domain of um, food, you don't eat it or you try to warm it um, if it's a little bit too late and you don't want to be touched in a social domain. Now, oh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, I thought I had a slide before, but I obviously don't have. Um, now, let's look what happens to people who are not able to smell. <coughs> we had a um, rap here relatively recently, and um, then we took together a lot of studies um, reporting consequences of the lack of the sense of smell. And people who lost, it's all of them are people who lost their sense of smell. So people who lost their sense of smell report problems related to food. They report um, problems <coughs> which are related to environmental hazards. It's actually here also this eating or detecting spoiled food. And they are very worried about not being able to perceive gas. Also, actually, this does not really happen. Maybe because it's just a very, um, it's not an incident happening very often that you have a gas leak. But they are worried about this. And 
they report worries about um, personal hygiene and social life, social insecurity. And um, importantly, about one third of them um, reports a depression which is in about the range of a minimal depression. But this is more than you would expect in a general population. However, you could say, okay, the, those people, these are people who lose something. They had a sense of smell and then they lose their sense of smell. I mean, no one likes to lose something and that could be a, could be a reason. Um, the good news is that um, those people adjust to the loss of the sense of smell over time. Um, that's controls, that's hyposmic patients, that's anosmic patients, and this is the uh, question about the uh, importance of the sense of smell in daily life. <coughs> and the importance of the sense of smell is reduced, which makes sense. And in about the first year of duration, um, you can see that people do not apply their sense of smell that often anymore. So they don't try to sniff on every tomato, which makes sense. That's quite an adaptive behavior. If you can't smell, then you should not try the whole time. That just causes frustration. Um, as I said before, um, those people are a little bit confounded because they lost something. That's why we looked at people who were never able to smell at all. So isolated congenital anosmia. Um, people have been um, yeah, have been diagnosed in the smell test clinic in Dresden and they received their MRI scans. So you can actually see those are people who have no olfactory bulb left. And we asked them a lot of different questions. That's questions related to eating behavior. Do you eat on fixed heights? That's on the top. Do you eat spontaneously? That's on the bottom. Washing behavior. Do you wash yourself? Do you try to keep a certain routine? Wash yourself at fixed times? Or do you do it spontaneous? There are no differences at all. Here we have the differences. That's household accidents. So <clears throat> you probably can compensate a lot, but still there are more um, household accidents, also including things like eating spoiled food, burning clothes if you try to iron them. And there are more social insecure, interestingly. And that's a nice result here. Um, that's the number of sexual relationships. We asked about sexual relationships. Um, so we have the congenital adolescents, we have the healthy controls. These are women in the area of Dresden. And in the area of Dresden, at least, our women reported, I have had sex with about three and some more um, different partners through my whole life. That's the men. They're healthy, healthy men. So <laughs> our healthy men in Dresden report, yeah, I have had sex with about eight different women in my life. There's quite some mismatch, but it's something you see very often. Um, and that's the congenital anosmics. And this difference is really striking. So anosmic men report um, a strongly reduced number of different sexual relationships compared to healthy men could be because they actually, uh, I would think they actually do not have that many sexual relationships, but it could of course also be something like that they are more honest than the other men, if you think they are just more honest. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, but actually I don't think that that's reasonable. <laughs> um, I think they really have a reduced number of sexual relationships why is quite interesting. Could be because of this enhanced social insecurity, so you have less approaching behavior. Could be that sex per se is not as rewarding just because the channel is missing. And that's why you don't seek it everywhere you can. So, but then another interesting thing here is, um, as well as in the people with the olfactory loss, we find here as well in the uh, people with congenital anosmia, about one third of the people who have um, depression scores in the range of a minimal depression. That's quite a lot. And um, the last slide is on depression, but I have a lot of crops on that side. Um, <clears throat> so I said that depression is related to people who cannot smell, who lost their sense of smell or who could never smell, have enhanced rates of depression. And the other thing also works, also works from the other way. So people who actually are depressed um, have a reduced sense of smell. There's some pioneer work from Bettina Pauser and her lab showing that your factory identification discrimination is reduced. 
And then we follow this and we measure the um, volume of the olfactory bulb and we measured the olfactory perception with the sniffing sticks. And we saw the same. And that's interestingly really related to the olfactory bulb volume, which was found to be reduced, oh, reduced this on reduced this on this side, um, in people who have a high depression score. You see we have quite a lot of people with high depression scores. Very high depression scores are above 30. That's a really severe depression. And we got those people because um, we also asked them psychosomatic clinic. So that's not normal. Well, that's not only a general population, it's quite a mixed population. Otherwise, you wouldn't get those scores. Um, we followed this and we looked at people who have a depression only, only people with major depression. Um, we compared their olfactory blood volume. Um, with regard to if they had childhood maltreatments or if they did not have childhood maltreatments, childhood maltreatment meaning really severe things. Mm. So it's not a parental divorce, this does not come that this is no childhood maltreatment here. It's a really severe beating with being um, on the hospital several times and stuff like that. And um, those people who have this major childhood stress, they have a reduced olfactory blood volume. And this was as well mirrored here in the olfactory threshold, which is significantly lower than the olfactory threshold of people without childhood maltreatment. And keep in mind, both of them have the same depression. Um, and then we also looked if the olfactory bulk volume could actually predict the outcome of psychotherapy. That's unpublished data, and I'm not, yeah, we are trying to write it up at the moment. Um, so these are non-depressive people. These are the ones with the therapeutic success. And that's the one um, who are therapeutic non-responders, so psychotherapy did not really work for them. And that's quite a lot of, or you normally see this um, with psychotherapy, that there are a lot of people who do not respond ideally, about 30%. <coughs> and here is a significant difference. So the olfactory bulk volume, also it's not a lot of people, but it's a significant effect. The olfactory bulk volume could predict um, therapeutic success. Um, and we did a study for um, phantosmia, parosmia, so those quantitative olfactory disorders. The scale is reversed, it's quite irritating. Um, the lower scores you have, the higher is your likelihood to have a qualitative olfactory disorder. And you see that this is actually higher in people with a severe depression compared to people with moderate, mild, or minimal depression. And we followed some people before and after psychotherapy with depression. And um, what we saw was that before therapy, we have some differences in the P2, which is about here, and the P2 compound um, of the chemosensory evoked potentials. Um, meaning that the patients, they have a lower amplitude. Uh, <coughs> could be attention related. And we also see that before psychotherapy, the blue ones are all controlled ones, and the orange ones um, are the depressed persons, and you see you have more blue spots than orange spots, and after psychotherapy, there are no big differences anymore. So actually, the olfactory processing, you can see this in the Tina Pose, I this, years ago that the olfactory processing um, becomes better in the course of psychotherapy. So conclusion, why should we smell actually? To detect and enjoy food, of course. To avoid microbial treats, maybe um, by the pathway of disgust. To communicate with others. And to preserve happiness. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm a philosopher, so I'm going to make that conceptual distinction. Uh, and really what I want to do is focus on the idea that there is a special kind of connection between smell and emotions or affective responses. And what I want to focus on is, is how we should think of that connection between olfaction, olfactory experiences and emotions if we're to make out the idea that there is that special kind of connection. Now, I think it's natural when we reflect on our ordinary emotions, things like anger and jealousy, to think that they are 
responses to or evaluations of situations. So if one is angry with someone, that's because you believe they've done something offensive. If uh, you're envious of someone, that's because you believe they have something good. So on that kind of understanding, emotions have a cognitive aspect to them. And philosophers have tended to think of this cognitive aspect as involving a certain kind of judgment. So to, to experience an emotion is to judge the situation to be of a certain kind, and that judgment elicits an effective response. But there have been criticisms from philosophers of that kind of view, and there are other philosophers who are happy to say that it, the, the cognitive component needn't be a judgment, it could be a perceptual representation of the situation, or it could involve a memory of a certain kind of situation, or perhaps an imagining of a situation, or even some fictional representation of the situation. But whatever it is, it's a, it's a cognitive representation of some state of affairs in the world. Now I think this kind of cognitive picture is developed within psychology, generally under the heading of the of the appraisal theory, and the only real difference here, I think, between the philosophical accounts and the psychological accounts is that philosophers tend to think that the evaluative component has to be conscious, and psychologists perhaps don't think that. Now, on this kind of picture of emotions, there's a very natural explanation of any differences in the ways different senses prompt or elicit emotions. And there's also, I think, an explanation of any distinctive connection between a particular sense and the way it elicits emotions. I think those differences can be explained in terms of differences in the objects of the different senses, where such differences entail differences in what the senses tell us about the world. So on this model of emotion, there's a certain picture of the way the senses can prompt or elicit emotions, and there'll be differences which are explicable simply in terms of the kinds of objects the different senses connect us with in the world. So, for example, if we take vision and olfaction, they're clearly different in this respect. So, uh, Elena didn't describe it, but in her paper, some of the stimuli she uses involve, for example, uh, pictures of a filthy lavatory and the smell of a filthy lavatory, and she asks subjects what kind of emotion these different stimuli prompt. Um, but you might think the visual experience of a filthy lavatory is different to the olfactory experience of a filthy lavatory, both in the degree of determinacy and in the degree of immediacy of the kind of experience involved. So the visual experience is both determinate and immediate. It's determinate in that the judgment there's a filthy lavatory there doesn't depend on the context. It's immediate. It's right there in front of you. In contrast, um, sorry, that's the, that's the determinacy, and it's immediate because it's, so it's determinate that there's no dependence on context. It's immediate in the sense that it's right there in front of you. And that contrasts, I think, with olfaction, where the smell of a dirty lavatory depends on the context to lead to a judgment that there's a filthy lavatory there. For example, we can imagine that in some contexts that very same smell might lead to the judgment that we're in the countryside. It's the smell of the farmyard or of pigs frolicking in muck in a way that would elicit a different kind of emotional response. So that olfactory experience is less determinate because it depends on its context to lead to a judgment and so to lead to an emotion. And it's less immediate in that the smell doesn't present the presence of the lavatory there in the way that vision does. And we might expect those differences to lead to differences in both the kinds of experience we, kinds of emotions we experience and the strength of those emotions. So I think there are two points here relevant to the kind of emotional response. The first is the differences in the, medi in the immediacy of the senses might affect the strength of any emotions that result. And the second is that what, if any emotions are elicited, will vary according to the idea or the judgment prompted by the context, and there can be differences there. So this is one way that we might explain any differences there are between senses, but also any similarities there are between senses with respect to the way they tend to elicit emotional responses. So it's striking, I think, that there's, I think your data showed that there wasn't a big difference between the visual and the um, olfactory stimulus when it came to the filthy lavatory case. Now, if we think there's a distinctive connection between olfaction and an emotion, that's kind of surprising because we don't think there's a particularly distinctive connection between vision and a kind of emotion. So that we have this same response across these two senses, perhaps needs explaining. It would be explained on this model by supposing they both lead to the judgment in the context. There's a filthy lavatory there, and so we need to discuss the emotion. Um, I think this kind of picture also allows us to explain why we don't typically uh, 
why, why smells don't typically elicit emotions like anger, sadness, or jealousy. And that's because the situations that olfaction can tell us about are not, are not situations that would directly lead to the kind of evaluation required to elicit those kinds of emotions. So if you think about the kind of evaluation required to elicit jealousy, that would be an event, say, the perception of uh, a stolen kiss. And a stolen kiss is not something you can perceive olfactory. So there's just that difference in the kind of things perceivable and so the kind of emotions that are elicitable. I think we can explain the connection between olfaction and certain kinds of memory produced uh, emotions too. So um, it's sometimes suggested that odors are effective at eliciting memories and perhaps better than vision. We might think that's a consequence of the indeterminacy of olfaction. So if vision is very determinate, maybe less room for uh, memory when we have visual experiences. So a visual experience, something that's particularly concrete, something right there in front of us, that may make no room for a memory, whereas an olfactory experience by being indeterminate may allow us or prompt or suggest memories in a way that vision doesn't. And if a memory is associated with an emotion, then we can expect olfaction to prompt by prompting memories to prompt emotions in a way that vision doesn't. And that might explain the kind of Proustian connections that are sometimes suggested between uh, olfaction and emotion. But if that so this picture, I think, explains some things, so explains some aspects of any connection there might be between the senses and emotions and between olfaction and emotions. Um, but it doesn't seem to ground any suggestion that there's a particular functional connection between olfaction and emotion. All we've got is the idea that sense experiences of various kinds can prompt emotions by grounding evaluations of situations, and different senses can ground different kinds of evaluations of situations. But there's nothing functional in that connection. One thing causes another. Um, and there's nothing particularly special about olfaction. But I think in some of the things that uh, Ilona has told us about, it suggests there's a different kind of mechanism going on. Um, so I think the, the picture I've just described can't be the whole story. In addition, there seems to be something like a constitutive connection between olfaction and emotion or at least olfaction and certain kinds of affective response. And this comes back to the discussion between Elisa and Sylvia and earlier on today. And to say that there's a constitutive connection, or the connection between them is constitutive, is to say that it's part of how we experience things through smell um, that we have a certain kind of affective response. So the very same, it's not that we experience smell and that leads us to a certain kind of affective response, but the smell already, in some sense, involves the affective response. So there's no neutral or non-affective way of characterizing the smell experience. Now, I think actually, there are, there are two ways of thinking about that kind of constitutive connection. We shouldn't necessarily think that olfactory experiences are hedonic or non-hedonic experiences. So one way of thinking about olfactory experiences might be that they are, they are like pain, or like the opposite of pain. So pains are intrinsically, by their very nature, non-hedonic. They're things we want to avoid, they're unpleasant. Uh, certain kinds of touching, might, stroking, might be the opposite. That might be hedonic experiences. But we think the experiences themselves are good or bad things to have. That's one way we might think of olfaction. So olfactory experiences might, in themselves, be things that are good or bad to have analogous to pains. But we might, and I think Barry suggested this earlier, we might also think of olfaction as presenting um, olfactants, and olfactants, or the presentation of olfactants, as being something that involves a certain kind of evaluation. So we perceive olfactants as good things, or we perceive olfactants as bad things, as pleasant things or as unpleasant things. But we can pull that apart from any idea that the experience of perceiving that is itself a good or a bad experience. And I think if we, if we think about vision, we can think in the case of vision, there are cases where we think that certain visual experiences are of inherently good or pleasant or valuable things. So experiences of the countryside in certain contexts, we might think that's an inherently pleasant thing to see. But we don't think the experience of seeing itself has any hedonic qualities. It's the, the experience reveals to us something good about what is out there. And we might think of olfaction in that kind of way. And I think if we think that there's a constitutive connection between uh, olfaction and emotional affective states, we could think of it as being modeled on either of these two models. Either the experiences 
are intrinsically hedonic or they give us an awareness of something pleasant in the world. And it'd be interesting to try and unpack those two things. I think on either model, we get an account of olfaction where there's a constitutive connection between olfaction and a certain kind of affective state. And I think one question here is whether that affective state counts as an emotion, certainly in the ordinary sense. So it's, it's not really anger or anything like that, but it's an affective state. So let me just finally say something about people who lack smell. I think if this picture of there being a constitutive connection between olfaction and affective states, and if we think of affective states as revealing certain valuable aspects of the world, then somebody who lacks smell is cut off from certain valuable aspects of the world. And we might think that that has an impact on their general psychological well-being. So being cut off in that way would explain why perhaps um, people who lack smell uh, tend to be more depressed or suffer from depression more than people who don't have smell. So if there's a question here, I guess it's, do you, do you see my, my distinction between the constitutive and the non-constitutive as mapping on to the empirical data? And if you think, if you agree that there's a constitutive connection between uh, olfaction and certain affective states, do you think it's best modeled on the model of the hedonic experience or the model of perceiving something valuable in the world? Do you want to maybe sit up front in case there's any questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I told Matthew before um, that I was kind of worried my work, working memory is not well enough trained for, for this response. And um, that's kind of true. Um, so I tried to answer what, um, yeah, what I got from from your very, very interesting um, ideas, actually. Um, so the first thing um, you talked about was that the, um, that you don't, that you don't, um, or that people normally are not able to identify orders on a free recall and are not, or are not good in naming orders. That this actually has an impact on, that we are so easily influenced by orders. So for instance, that we see this high label effects like Sylvia, um, showed in the study from um, Raphael Hertz, and we also saw this in this discussed study, that there are really some high label effects. So if you present some contextual information to orders, then people are very influenced by this contextual information, probably because they do not have this name of the order themselves, so the order themselves is not, um, is not categorized. Very good. So can I ask, does that mean that they are thinking, okay, this odour, it could be the odour of a filthy lavatory or it could be the odour of the farmyard, and they think that's disgusting and that's okay, and the context then shifts the label and so shifts the conception of what's out there producing the smell, or is that not what's happening? I would rather not think so. Um, I mean, there are several orders, for instance, the pieces order, I think is relatively easy to identify to most people. I'm not sure what your <laughs> ideas about this are. But, um, I think that's that's quite, yeah, quite an easy order. Um, but a lot of other orders, for instance, sweat order. I don't think you really say, ah, oh, this could be sweat or this could be parmesan cheese. Hmm, let's say what they think, yeah, what they suggest, and then I take this one. Uh, you rather have some kind of strange perception. This is something maybe mud related or mold related or organic, uh, but on on a more broad category, definitely not. A small, yeah. And so, yes, yeah. Uh, just a clarification question, but you, you said that uh, uh, there is no habituation for disgusting smells, and I was wondering what, what the evidence is for that. You go back to. Thank you. Um, yes, it's just about it. I can, can tell about it. Um, what we did were um, we called our participants back two times, so 14 days later and 14 days later. And we repeated the whole experiment again. And we asked them, how disgusting do you think this is? No, we asked them, um, how much was anger evoked, and sadness evoked, and disgust evoked, and all of the other things. Once again, all of the basic emotions. And we see that for um, auditory cues, as well as for visual cues, as well as for haptic cues, they touch themselves, discriminative haptic cues, and um, they do not think this is as disgusting as it was the first time. So the disgust rating actually decreases. Um, this may be related to exactly the discussion we had, that um, they just perceive it and think, ah, yeah, okay, that's the thing I had last time. Because it's very easy to identify it, to name it, and um, that's why they have a representation 
and um, to store it or to combine it with the memory you had in the situation. Last time I was here in an experiment, I had the same thing in an experiment. This was definitely not harmful. I did not have to vomit. It does not um, evoke disgust as much anymore. But for orders, um, the disgust ratings were the same 14 days later and about one month later. And you didn't test for the ident re-identification whether they realized that it was exactly the same no. smell? No, but I would very much suggest, um, or would very much think that they, that they knew it was the same smell. Everything else would be surprising. I mean, they got the same pictures, and they are mm -hmm. very able to identify that this were the same pictures. They got the same auditory cues. I think they would have remembered this. So why should they get different smells? But we have not checked for this, no. Yeah, you could change and introduce new ones and see. Yeah, yeah. No, we did not check. Just quickly, follow, so in, in thinking of the smell in this case, the fecal smell is disgusting. Is it the sm somehow the smell itself is disgusting? So the, the experience of the smell or the, the smell thing, as it were, or is it the thought that that smell is telling me about something in the world and that thing in the world is disgusting? I don't think so. I don't so it's, think it's the first thing, the smell mm -hmm. itself is disgusting. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think the latter. Yeah. Or yeah. I, yeah. opposite. Okay. Um, I think, I think, so the kinds of experiments you described, although they're nicely controlled and very provocative, for, at least in my own experience, an odor is much more vivid and a, a, a better, um, it better captures the authentic experience, as it were, as opposed to seeing a picture of the dirty laboratory. It would be different if you, took their hand, walked them downstairs. I don't know if you were in the men's room yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, and, and show them that. And I think you might end up tilting responses in a, a much more robust way. Um, but I, I mean, I think the very fact that, say, take um, isovaleric acid, which depending on the label could smell what could could be Parmesan cheese or vomit or strong body odor. Um, the fact that you you just don't have the right mapping of that sensory information onto um, object knowledge, lexical semantic knowledge in the brain. And so really until you can constrain that with your own preconceived notions or with a label or other contexts, that's when you instantiate the emotional response. That's my take on it. We had a question to the mic first, and what? then Barry after. Well, I, I was just going to add something about indole, the um, molecule. It occurs naturally in jasmine and also in feces. And if you use indole um, in perfumery, uh, people involved in perfumery absolutely adore the smell of indoor because they know what it does. So with the context, then your disgust mm -hmm. does entirely disappear. If you continue to believe it's just going to be improved, you should put it around the room, everybody really was, <coughs> and the perfume was going to be more indoor. Mm -hmm. So I think in the context, you can take away the situation, but not everybody would be using indoor in that way. But this is but exactly what you described um, is, a, is an example of a name and an order, at least for the expert group you described. Mm. So they really can categorize this order. Yeah. So they have, a, they have an explicit memory to those. There. So yeah. question at the back of Barry, I think. Yeah. So, so in, in replying to Matt, perhaps one of your difficulties is um, the issue that people have in these rather unnatural experiences of being presented just with an odor. Because most of the time we're presented with odors for things, or for events, or for surroundings. So it's a very funny thing to learn to smell a little bottle, or a stick, or a pen, which doesn't come with the rest of the multisensory cues that usually embed it within a particular event. And, and therefore, you know, to, to ask people, what emotion does this have? You know, gee, or, and that's probably why people have difficulty naming them, even though they can sometimes say the, the odor is familiar, because it's just not coming with the cues. Whereas, you know, when you're in a, in a fruit shop and you pick up a, an apple or a, an orange or a lemon, you're getting an experience which, if I gave it to you, sort of blindfolded, you say, now what is that? Uh, so, so 
So first of all, I think it's a very odd thing to do, to ask people to, to sort of take owners extracted from other multi-sensory environments and then ask them to do these things, either evaluate them or not. And the other thing is, I thought it was the case that you only get this link between um, episodic memory and, emo and uh, odor when these are highly emotionally charged uh, episodes. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so that's really what's doing the, the connecting and binding. Because you know, yeah. thank goodness we don't remember all the smells and odors of our day through London, right? But um, if we're in a particularly sort of um, emotionally charged environment, and then again we're getting multi-sensory cues, so it's not surprising that it might be that if you're getting heightened emotion, a quick connection to the amygdala, re-smelling that. And if it's strong enough to bring back all the other parts of the queue, then you get something. So, so I don't think you should concede to Matt that it's it's so very you know different. He said you know an emotion is usually about thinking about a kiss and all the rest of it. I think if it, if it was a very good kiss uh, and it was really quite important and exciting for your life, then the odor might indeed bring that back because so I don't want to rule something. that out, but, but it was less. So I think that you never said that you didn't get these emotions, just that they were far less common. Is that right? So you thought? No, you were talking about, um, about quite complicated emotions, except the example with your kiss. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then you talked about envy, um, which also develops a little later in life. That's not a basic emotion you can find in newborns, envy. That's something yeah, you have to be quite social. You have to have some kind of theory of mind in order to, to get an envy reaction. And, um, I would rather doubt that you would find that really in that you could evoke anything like empathy um, really in, in persons or pride just by order. If you do not cue in order to, like Greg said, if you do not cue in order to an event which very much evoked pride. You think you could have a, an envy evoking smell? Yeah, well, well, well no, I don't think you could so have an envy invoking smell. I think yeah. you could have. An episodic memory of that some episode, moment of envy, kind, yeah. which is very tightly bound with the odor because it's episodic and it was taking place there and then. The smell of that restaurant where the envy was right. <laughs> but then, but that smell becomes evaluative and a uh, judgment. And at the beginning of your presentation, you sort of dismissed the idea that maybe some of these more complex emotions were precisely those which you had to evaluate to arrive at that emotional state. And so uh, my question is, like, are you ready to dismiss that? No, so my suggestion was that because they involve evaluation, it may be that in many cases, smells don't elicit that kind of, so in every, apart from, from memory, smells of our environments don't elicit that kind of evaluation of the environment. So they, they might elicit disgust, Perhaps fear, but not jealousy. Let's say, because the the, well, the olfactory information isn't sufficient for us to recognise this as a situation which would prompt jealousy. Let's say. Okay, that was the thought. One, one I'm going to. Okay, I'm going to be very nice and give one more. Well, we actually had one over there that he hasn't had, so I'm going to be nice and give both a chance, and then uh -huh. we're going to wrap up. Otherwise, we will finish tomorrow. Okay. So, uh, Jay, do you want to? Do you want to? Well, so th this is a point I'd like to bring up here for anyone to talk about. Obviously, this, this, we're, we're dealing with humans here, right? But think about non-human animals. And smells evoke a lot, I mean, as far as we can tell, a lot of emotions. Fear, anger, maybe sadness. Not disgust. My dog is not disgusted by anything. But he's afraid of certain things. So there's this kind of really bizarre functional break divide between an the animals who really quite rely on smell and then us kind of defeat people <laughs> talking about the civilized subtleties of the olfactory system. But it's not the odor itself, right? It's the object the odor is identifying that it's the, it's the, it's the odor object. Mm, they, don't have, they don't have disgusting objects in the dog world. Maybe no. <laughs> so in no human beings, I don't know. He doesn't find a skunk disgusting? Sure, sure he does. 
Mm -hmm. But my question yeah. is, doesn't you want to, to have some food because you think it's not good for you? Yeah, it definitely. Mm -hmm. He's bored, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking about. <laughs> okay, we're going to put a question up to the right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I'm an electrical engineer, and so from, from my perspective, it seems that at the hardware level, sensor level, we have high resolution, we have ability to sense thousands of, of, of different smells and molecules. But it seems at the software level, our brain is doing you know, very low-pass filtering heuristics. And you know, like you said in your talk, we can't even resolve smells very accurately. So I wonder whether this is because maybe millions or billions of years ago, are, we required to have very accurate smell. But as we've evolved, it's become so important. So that our brain is not, it, it's, the software part is not doing that not matching with the hardware. We're doing a lot of heuristic and, and filtering. Do you, do you think that might be possible? It's an interesting question. It's a question if you have lost some functions in your factory sense um, over evolution, or if you evoluted some other senses um, which do more than the sense of affection, which just did not develop, develop on the same, same scale. Um, so we are still quite good in the factory world. Uh, there was this review from um, Sina and Sobel. Um, they pointed it out that we are very good at detecting orders, of course, and we are kind of good in identifying orders if we do this in a cute manner, but not in a free manner. And we are relatively good in associating things with certain orders. And we are extremely good in food learning. So we have very, very rapidly we learn and which food we should eat and which food we should not eat. So conditioning goes very nicely. And that's probably a lot of things um, which you need, and that's probably more or less enough, or could be more or less enough, <coughs> together with some social things. But all of this categorization, which helps you to memorize and so on, I'm not sure if this is something um, which is actually lost, or if this is something which, I would better vote for the latter, um, that this is something which um, cre was created or which developed in evolution together with the um, sense of audition, together with language acquisition, and together with results. Okay, great. Thank you so much for talking.